Thank you. Let, let's remain standing, if you would, just for a moment. Welcome all you who's watching online. Um, <clears throat> we need Jesus. <laughs> That's just about it. And um, before I was, uh, when I was preparing for this message, I felt the Holy Spirit just kind of lead me in a different direction. And I prepared this message before this week's events. And when after all this was unfolding, I realized why I felt like the Holy Spirit changed it. And so I feel like this is a perfect message to preach on this weekend. And the Holy Spirit, He wants to speak to us and help us. Um, and we want to honor these seven lives. Every week, there's so many lives that are lost. But in light of the national scope of this, uh, we're going to honor these seven people today. And, um, and we're going to do our best to become like Jesus. And by no means am I going to tell you what to do and if I give you three points, it's going to fix everything because it's not. And quite frankly, I don't know what to tell you. This is so deep and so embedded in our country that it's only going to take God to raise us up as a church, as a people, to love and to do this. So I would never assume that role just to give you quick answers and kind of preach at you. That's totally insensitive. Um, but I do believe what the Bible says. And I believe God's given our church a unique platform um, to come together racially. In this moment, we do anyway, but in this moment, we come together and we let Jesus come through. So if you don't mind, grab your neighbor's hand next to you, please. And Lord, I just thank you today for what you're doing. Um, Lord, we pray for these seven families that lost a husband, a brother, a father, a son, a friend. Um, Lord, just they're grieving today. Our nation is grieving in so many different ways. And, Lord, we need you right now. And we ask for your presence to come into this room and online today. And you would, Lord, just use my words to uh, give hope, give conviction. Jesus, we ask you to sweep across our nation, coast to coast, border to border. Lord, in the deep south and the deep north and up in the north and the northwest and out west and all of it, Lord, and northeast the Midwest, every town, every city, every neighborhood, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Come to it. We need you, Jesus, right now. We need our hearts to be healed, red, yellow, black, white, and brown. And, Lord, we're, we believe that you can do it. Nothing is impossible with you. And we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Go ahead and give your neighbor a hug or a handshake. may be seated today. We're in the second week of our series, Coloring Inside the Lines, and here in a moment I want to set this message up. I'm going to use this cross as a prop, and then I'm going to segue in. I, I do, I feel like it's my responsibility to address the issues that happened this week and come from a scriptural perspective so that we are empowered to do something, and so I'm going to do that today. So if you want to open your Bibles to Matthew 23, verse 23, or just follow me on the screen here in just a moment, my message is entitled Magic Kingdom. And I think as you see this unfold today, you'll understand, I think, why the Holy Spirit changed this. Um, but some people think that God has a magic kingdom, but really He doesn't. Uh, he colors inside the lines of our lives really day to day, and that really reflects what He wants to do, and it reflects our part in what we should do. God's picture for our lives is full of hope and everything. And yet, sometimes in a magic kingdom idea, we think that he's going to give an instant solution to every situation in a moment's time, and really God doesn't do that. But however, he is the total solution of everything that we need. Amen? And a magic kingdom can also imply an ATM machine idea instantaneous when God wants a relationship idea with every one of us. And so in this message today, in this one verse, this whole chapter, Jesus is basically, just for our vernacular and our mindset, he's going off on fake Christians. He's going off on fake preachers. He's going off on institutions that make it hard for people, put burdens on people that are hypocrites. And through the whole chapter, he just goes through it verse by verse by verse. And so we're going to read one of those verses today. And I think it's going to touch us. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, Hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income of your herb gardens, 
but you ignore the more important aspects of the law. Please follow me and say justice, mercy, and faith. But notice what Jesus said. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So, Father, I thank you for this message and use us today for your glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. And so in this idea, uh, obviously God does not have a magic kingdom. I want to illustrate that and, and make sure we understand. I'm using that title to actually uh, re uh, repel this idea. What Jesus does have in this verse, I believe, is shows us two things. He shows us his big picture, this big picture kingdom, and he also shows a relational kingdom. The big picture kingdom translates into relationships. Jesus said for you and I to take up our cross and to follow him. In this verse, Jesus is connecting on four huge areas of our life that just so happen to slap our country in the face this morning. Jesus' big picture, in short, is for you and I to love God and love people. It's just about that simple. Because how we treat others reflects our depth and our connection to God. And Jesus is wanting you and I to connect with this idea so that we see ourselves a part of something bigger than ourselves. In this verse, though, he's rebuking these preachers, these fake Christians, because Jesus wants you and I to have a full life, and they weren't having a full life. A full life is to have peace with God and, that, and to the best of our ability, have peace with others. But these people weren't doing that. And so Jesus is talking about this idea of tithing, which deals with our heart. And last week we talked about when we give our finance, it's letting God become the greatest possession of our life instead of our possessions being uh, the possession of our life. But then he goes deeper and he talks about justice, mercy, and faith. Now notice this really, they were missing it because all these issues deal with a heart condition. Tithing, obviously we give God finances and he has our heart and he blesses us. Justice, though, in this Greek word, it means a tribunal seat to be for or against, and it gives the indication it's the choice of the person. Then he talks about mercy, and this word mercy actually means compassion, divine grace. And then faith here actually means trustworthy and a genuine and a genuineness. I want you to think about our perspective. There's a vertical reaction to God, but if there's a vertical reaction to God, at some point there has to be a, hor a, a horizontal reaching out to others. You can't have one without the other. You have to have both to complete this symbol of the cross, which is the symbol of hope for the world. Now think about this text. Think about everything God does for us coming down vertically. He comes down and he gives us opportunity to have health, have income, have breath, live life, have family, have success, have dreams. That's amazing. So it is incumbent upon us to give to God what he asks. So he's our greatest possession. But then let's keep on going. God gives you and I, he gives us justice. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? God is for us, not against us. God is for humanity, not against us. God is for humanity, not against us. God is for us. I want you to think about today, just think about, aren't you glad that God is for us? And he was for us when we were against him, but he was still for us today. So it's incumbent that we worship him with our giving. We worship him for his justice. And then has God not given us all abundant mercy? Every morning we have new mercies. I don't know about you, but I need a lot of mercy every single day. And he's given you and I mercy. And then he's given you and I the ability to have faith. He's given to every man a measure of faith. So all these things coming down, it's a natural reaction to vertically look up and reach up and give God our heart through our giving. But also we thank him for his justice. We thank him for his mercy. We thank him for his faith. And we are vertically positioned to worship him. And then at some point, He's asking you and I in the big picture kingdom to let our vertical worship become horizontal love and reaching out. You and I have to love people past what we see because we love a God who we can't see. 
We don't love people because they're white or black, rich or poor, gay or transgender or public and democratic. We love them because there's something greater in them because we love a God who we can't see and he loved us when we did not love him. You can shout back if you want to today. We're 1030 in the morning, kind of awake. And so we, we vertically worship and we horizontally reach out, folks, and this becomes this picture of this cross. And so I ask me, and I ask you, and I ask those online, how does our cross look this morning? Because this transposes over to something that Jesus takes this big picture idea of loving God, loving people, how we treat people. We love past what we see because we love a God who we can't see. The Bible says, how can we hate our brother but love God? Or how can we hate our brother who we see but love God who we can't? This whole thing is based on relationships. This is a relational kingdom. And Jesus is wanting you and I to embrace this idea, but the relational kingdom is very difficult. Please hear this. Re this relational kingdom idea requires and produces life change. And this is why you and I prefer this magic kingdom, because look, I notice this. The magic kingdom gives everything in a moment. It takes the relationship part out. The magic kingdom gives us something without us changing in the process. And it's in a day instead of it being walked out day by day. And I'm going to segue here. This is what's translating in our nation right now. The, the, the cultural divide is so deep and so complicated that there is no quick answers. However, Jesus wants to be the solution, not only for our life, but coming through our life for others to have hope as we have hope. And I, and, and, and I want you to think about this today, and I want to do something here in just a moment. I'm going to read these seven names, two African-American men, four white policemen that were killed this week. And, and this may make you uncomfortable today, and, I, and I'm not trying on purpose, but maybe the Holy Spirit is. Because he's wanting you and I as a church to arise and to embrace our cross so that we vertically are loving and we're horizontally reaching out. I am going to ask everyone in this room to take a step of courage, whatever you want to call it, and think of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, not as two black men, but as two men that are killed, that were killed. I challenge all of us to think about if that was our husband, our father, our brother, our best friend. Because notice what the world wants and what the enemy wants is for us to be detached from one another based on cultural stuff or I don't understand or this. And Jesus has no part of that. Jesus wants all of us. We may never agree on every point, but he never told us to agree on every point. He just told us to be in unity and to love one another as he loves us. And so while you and I as humans tend to detach ourselves from things we don't understand and we tend to say, well, you know, well, that was, you know, this and I don't get it. And I'm not here to get political, but, but, but this is it, folks. We don't look at it as, well, you know, they were this or they were that. No, these are two fathers gone. And what if our dad was gone? I want us to feel the reality of what other people feel, and our perspective isn't the only perspective, and our reality isn't the only reality. And I want us to understand that this vertical worship is to produce this horizontal respect and love. Jesus never called the church to make a point. He's called the church to make a difference. And when you and I are arguing and we're fighting over differences and making points, we're not making a difference because when I listen and respect and seek to understand, our hearts open up to one another and then we can hold hands in, in, the, in, the, in the bond of faith and begin to make a difference. So I want to honor today Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, two African men killed, five white policemen gunned down, Brent Thompson, Michael Crawl. Patrick Zamar Ripa, Mike Smith, and Lon Arends. Jesus is asking you and I 
to not detach and get political and bicker and go tit for tat, but to instead embrace the symbol of the cross and vertically worship and horizontally begin to do what this verse is asking you and I to do. Notice in this picture I captured from CNN, I want them to show it here. And this is a, pow- it's a, it's a potent picture. Who can heal America? And Pastor Kim saw a picture when the cops were being shot at. There was an African American, Hispanic, white, and a fourth cop all huddled together behind a car trying to survive. And what hit me out of this picture is when tragedy strikes, it doesn't matter where we're from anymore. It brings out the humanity of who we are. And I love this. This is in Dallas, of course, and this police officer crying, holding a white woman. This is a great image, though, of what God is wanting to do. Not that we all have to hug each other all the time, but this is about you and I opening our hearts so that we can be the church and reflect the love of God to a very complex and painful and serious issue. And so what the enemy wants to do is to take you and I and divide us and splinter us and you don't know and blah, blah, blah. And this was a you know, bad guy and this was a bad guy. And I want to say this. We should never drink the Kool-Aid to vilify, to justify someone being killed. And even if, I want to just say something here real quick on this, on Who Can Heal America, because even if things are true about individuals who were killed this week, I think about the love of God for me. I don't want to bring up old stuff, but, but, but maybe I do. But when Trayvon Martin was gunned down, they were saying on the news, well, he had weed in his system, and he was suspended from school. And that's to give me a, an assurance of that's good reason for a young man to be killed. There's a lot of white people that are high, too. And there's other people that are suspended from school, too. We should never accept vilifying someone to justifying a life being taken. Jesus wants you and I to understand that who can heal America? This is so deep, but I'm going to say this. I, I'm not trying to dumb it down because people feel fear right now, and we need to respect that, and they feel pain. And Jesus is the answer. And the cross, this symbol of the cross, well, I do not have a one, two, three homily to help us know what to do. I don't know what to do. But I do know that if you and I will vertically worship and horizontally begin to reach out and simply exemplify Jesus, I believe our lives and the lives of others can get better. That the racism we've been taught can be unplugged out of our heart and we can love God who we can't see. We can love our brother who we can't see. And we can see people past black, white, red, yellow, rich, poor, and we can reach for them with the love of God. Why? Now, here's why. Because in this relational kingdom, here's what Jesus is asking us to do. Yes, we tithe. I want to encourage you, if you, you know, yes, take that step. Let God be your greatest possession, and he will bless you. And let's go further. Justice. Please know, Jesus is for justice. Jesus is for justice. God is for humanity. The Bible is full of verses about the widows, the orphans, the marginalized. Read the scripture. He is for educational gaps. He is for the poor. He is for marginalized groups. Jesus wants justice for all. Thank you for the great amens, but he does. And God is for us, not against us. So what he wants us to do, folks, is vertically we worship with in many ways, in this verse, one of them's tithing, but now horizontally, we can't just vertically worship without eventually starting to reach out. And so he's wanting us to vertically worship, and horizontally, we give justice. We are for people. We are for all people. We love all people. We don't have a checklist. Well, they check, check, check. Now I love them. While I was a sinner, Jesus died for me. Therefore, this may shake you up. Come on, stay with me, stay with me. We love black people. We love white people. We love Asian. We love Latino. We love uh, uh, people from India and the Middle East. And we love Muslims. And we love Islamists. And we love Mormons. And we love atheists and agnostics. And we love homosexuals. And we love heterosexuals. And we love transgenders. And we love rich. And we love the poor. And we love good. And we love bad. And we love politicians. Come on now. Watch out. What, what? And we love... Even the patriots. I don't know. God's working on me. We love people. 
period. And we are, and we horizontally, we, we give justice because God is for us. We are for them. And I want us to be honest today and come out of the shadows of our upbringing, out of the shadows of our opinion, out of the shadows of our churches, out of the shadows of blah, blah, blah. And let's feel what our country is feeling and feel what different people are feeling because Jesus feels how we feel. He knows how we feel. So we do our best to reach out and say, explain to me what you're feeling so that I can take my cross and vertically worship and horizontally reach out. I'm asking this congregation, I cannot control anything, but I'm asking you online and at City Church, I'm asking us as white people to please talk less. And I'm asking us to listen and to respect that people that are not white may be proven over time have different experiences than we do. And I'm asking us to listen and, re- and be respectful and not get into tit-for-tat debating, but to listen and be respectful. And I'm asking all non-white people in our church to please share with us what you feel so that we can come together right now so that we can listen and seek to understand one another. And listen, voting is important. Go vote this fall. But we need to pray for our president. God bless him. We need to pray for Mr. Trump and Mrs. And, uh, and Mrs. Clinton. We need, our country needs Jesus right now. And what they don't need is the church on Facebook or in other venues hating on each other, going off on each other, letting politics or other things divide us when this cross is to unify all of us at the greatest bond ever. It's the grace of Jesus. So we come together. And listen, I'm not here to persuade you to vote. I'm not here to change your perspective. We may never agree on most of it, but can we love one another? And can we show Jesus to our brothers and sisters? And shouldn't we arise and take up our cross and follow him? Because Jesus is not a Baptist Jesus. He's not a Pentecostal Jesus. He's not a Catholic Jesus. He's not an American Jesus. He's just Jesus for all people all over the world, all backgrounds, all demographics, all conditions, all records. He's just Jesus. Therefore, I vertically worship and I horizontally seek to reach out, and I give justice for all. Let's go, and, and let's keep on going for time. Then I'm merciful. And again, like I said, Jesus said, be merciful. Don't ignore the more important things. This literally means compassionate, divine grace. Ladies and gentlemen, good God, haven't we all received divine grace? But here's the depravity of humanity. We do it, we all do it. We tend to select who deserves our compassion. Well, they are crackhead. They lost their house. They don't deserve our help. Well, they, you know, they, you know, I mean, they're a criminal. They don't deserve a second chance. And they did this, and they don't deserve that. Folks, that's our depravity. Oh, how quickly we forget who's looking back at us in the mirror. If it wasn't for the grace of God, where would we all be? Right? And let's just be honest. Come on now. Let's be honest. Everyone in here looks nice and pretty and cute and handsome, trying to get someone if you're not, if you're not with someone. It's a good place to do it. Look right at me. Don't look at your neighbor. Look right at me. But, but, but follow me. We're all two steps away. Two from messing our life up. We're, none of us are exempt from anything. How dare we think that we're above falling. None of us are above falling. So look at our depravity, though. Every human does this. We, we categorize people into ethnicity or, or, or economics or lifestyle or records, and, we, and then we gauge what they deserve. Folks, we don't deserve the love and the mercy of God that clothed you this morning while you were in bed. And so, therefore, we receive it and we give it away. We do our best. We're imperfect, but we give it away and we love and we go and we are the church. And you and I cannot solve all the problems. They're just so massive. What we can do is we all have a family. We all have a neighbor. We all have someone we live with, our next two. And we can begin to exemplify this vertical and horizontal to the people in our life, one person at a time. Because most of us 
us will never be Oprah or Billy Graham or this or that, but you can touch one person in your life. And if you and I will vertically worship and horizontally reach out, Jesus can melt the hard heart of a racist. He can change the system of our country. He can change a family and a neighborhood. It may take time, but he can do it. I just am simple enough to believe. And then in closing, he said faith. And this actually means to be genuine and authentic here. And so our faith in Jesus is not to make us pompous and pious and judging and blah, 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 and this and that and fighting. It's to make us genuine and authentic people. It's to make us more like him. Read the Gospels. Jesus, how did Jesus handle people, folks? Look at the Gospels. How did Jesus handle people? There was a woman caught in the act of adultery, and he spared her. There was a man who was a thief, and he went to his house and redeemed him. There was a woman that had seven devils in her, and Jesus came and cast them out. Jesus connected to people, and he's asking you and I as Christ followers to connect to him and to connect to people. He's asking us to connect to him and horizontally reach out to people. Who can heal America? I believe God can, but it doesn't happen by you and I sitting on a chair and saying, God, God, touch the white people. God, touch the black people. God, just touch our president. No, it, 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 it's you and I getting up off the couch, and we go outside to work, and we go do, and we take up our cross, and we vertically love God, and we horizontally treat people the way we want to be treated, and we seek to love them, and we seek to show justice, mercy, and faith to them because God has done it for us. In closing, I want to tell you the story. Hope this encouraged you today, challenged you. When I was in South Africa, I was there three years after the apartheid was abolished. My friend and I were there, and we were preaching for churches, and our friend Jerry, they were watching last night from Africa. They were really touched by this, this story. I brought this story up again. This happened about, gosh, 13, 15 years ago. And my friend and I were in the hotel. They wanted us to stay in a hotel for different reasons. And so we were waiting for him to come see us during the day. And my friend said, you know, I really feel like we need to worship Jerry's feet. Or excuse me, we need to wash Jerry's feet. John 13, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And I said, yeah, let's do it. So he came and knocked on the door. And he came in agitated. He came in mad. He was, this is a very calm, loving man. He came in opposite of that. We didn't ask him what was going on. We just said, Jerry, you know, we just feel like God want you know, wants us to wash your feet. And he was shy and kind of, you know, nervous. It's, it, it's awkward, three men. We want to wash your feet. It's kind of strange. Um, and so we went into the bathroom, and he rolled up his pants, and he sat, I'll never forget, on one end of the bathtub. And we turned the water on, and Jake got on his knees and washed his feet, dusty from the sandals, walking miles, you know. And I got on my knees and washed his feet after that. We worshiped together and prayed. And he said, <clears throat> before we got to our hotel, he uh, stopped at a store. And this little kid and his dad were there in the store, and the kid looked at him and called him a monkey. And the father heard it and was looking at Jerry, seeing what he would do. And he said, when you wash my feet, the anger left. And just two white dudes that were dumb enough to listen to God didn't know what happened to him, somehow was used to get anger out. I've never been called a monkey. I don't know what that's like. But what if we would serve one another? What if we would do this today? Could it be that the Holy Spirit could begin to get anger and fear 
and walls out of the hearts of men and women of all ethnicities. If we could vertically worship and horizontally begin to reach out and just do what Jesus said to do and choose to see our fellow man like God sees us what could happen I believe one person at a time could be healed by the love of God This is our moment. God didn't, <clears throat> God didn't bring us together, excuse me, at City Church to pat ourselves on the back and say we're together on Sundays. He's brought us together for this moment. We can't control our city, but we can control what we do. And we can mirror Jesus and see one life changed at a time for the glory of our God. If you believe in this Jesus, give him a great standing ovation. He's worthy. Come on, he's worthy. He's worthy. bow your head if you would. Excuse me. Pardon me. As your head is bowed today, Hanami would say in this moment, online and in this room, I've never received Jesus and I want to receive him. Or you would say, I have received him, but I'm at a distance with God and I want God today in my life. Remember, he hasn't called us to make points. Anyone can do that. He's called us to make a difference. And your life can be raised up and God do great things through it. And you would say today, you want Jesus for the first time or you want to recommit your life to him. If that's you in this moment, raise your hand to heaven at 1030. I want to pray for you today. God bless you. 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 Six people coming to Jesus today. Isn't that awesome? God bless you. I see you over here. Bow your head a little bit longer just with me, please. We're going to sing a worship song together. But I'm, I'm going to, I want to pray this for myself, and I want to ask you, would, would you say, PD, I want my cross to look better? Uh, it's not a magic kingdom. It's a big picture relational kingdom. And I want my vertical to match my horizontal and my horizontal to match my vertical. And I want to get the scales and the veils on my heart and eyes that, that, that I have received. And I want just to be like Jesus, small steps at a time. Giving my heart through many ways. Today's verse through giving. But have justice, mercy, and faith and you want support vertically or horizontally or both, if that's you, raise your hand right now, and I'm going to pray for you in this room today. God bless you. Hands up everywhere. Thank you for raising your hands. Follow me in this prayer so no one's left out, and please say, Lord Jesus, my heart is yours, and I come to you. Please forgive me for any wrong. I turn from it, and I walk towards you, and I move to you. Give me the courage to carry my cross in my heart towards you and my heart toward others. Giving justice, mercy, faith. I'm yours in the name of Jesus. I want Pastor A to sing this song. And as she sings it, if you just want to raise your hands and sing it with her, Jesus at the center of, the, of it all, and think about this message and how we need it today. Let's worship with her, and then I'll come back in just a moment. Let's raise it together. Oh, Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center.
see that today. Jesus be the center of our life. I'm going to ask the prayer team to join me here at the altar. We're going to take about five to seven minutes and respond to God. Several of you received Jesus today. Thank you so much for that step you took. And I want to encourage you to come down. I want to give you a Bible to help you walk this out. And if you raise your hands to respond to the message, we're here to pray for you today and support you. You can take communion as you, as you want to on your own. It's in the back and it's in the front. You can sit in your seat. And Pastor Jane will sing this song a little bit longer and then she'll dismiss us. If you want to pray with your neighbor right in your seat, uh, I'm asking, well, I mean, you're welcome to do that. We need all the prayer we can give. And uh, just reach out. If you want prayer, come in the center aisle. If you want communion, you can go back or come down the side aisles. And uh, I pray you have a great week. I pray that we all put this into practice. And one step at a time, one person at a time. May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May he be good to you. And may he give you his peace. And may he give you out of the courage to carry our cross. In Jesus' name, let's respond to God.